We've gone over the history, economics, and techniques of advertising, but what does that mean for our society as a whole? We will explore this by looking at societal changes, bombardment, and trivialization. Marketers are no longer talking to us, but they are having a conversation with us, attempting to cater to us on a more personal level by soliciting feedback through websites and collecting user data. Targeting has become easier with the boom of media. Advertisers are, are able to present their messages to the intended audience instead of the whole through hundreds of TV stations, radio stations, and millions of websites. If you want to reach kids, you just advertise on Nick. And if you want to reach people who cook, there's a website for that. So what this does is that it makes lifestyle messages more prominent and has, contribu and has contributed to a major societal change. Branding was a means of differentiating almost identical products, but it has become a means to differenti differentiate the person. And although ads are seen are created in isolation, they are not viewed so. Our environment, mood, social lens, and the context in which the ad is placed affect the ad's performance. We took a, a look at two popular shows, World Wrestling Entertainment's Raw and SpongeBob SquarePants, and the TV commercials placed in those time slots. Research done by Dita and Solier identified wrestling as a product-based subculture that values the community aspect of wrestling, but also, the by also vicariously living uh, through the wrestlers who are the ideal male, strong and testosterone-filled. During the show, ads for video games are prominent. This allows the viewers of Raw to live out that uh, ideal male persona in games like Dante's Inferno. SpongeBob SquarePants. Younger children have a hard time differentiating commercials from the show. And um, for, for the most part, kids' commercials are like the show, upbeat and fun. So it makes it hard for them to distinguish the two and to understand their persuasive nature. However, um, the older we get, the more we are aware of the differences between TVs and commercials, and the more skeptical, skeptical we become. A determinant of that uh, of the effectiveness of advertising is linked to parent compliance as well. In our modern American culture, advertising is everywhere. We are constantly surrounded by it, and one would be hard pressed to find a place of solace from the never ending stream of advertisement. In one day, the average American will be exposed to 3,500 advertisements. Just a short walk down a city street can provide a look at this continuous bombardment. Billboards fill the skyline, newspaper and magazine stands clutter the sidewalk, posters appear on walls and at bus stops, discarded flyers catch the wind and blow through the streets. Even school children walk by wearing prominently displayed brands. Technology has given advertisers even more mediums for marketing products, and with the onset of the internet, the question to ask might be, has the age of information given way to the age of over-information? Just a brief listing of the mediums currently employed by advertisers includes magazines, television commercials, billboards, bus stops, radio, wall posters, apparel, Internet, social networks, cell phones, newspaper, and even ghost signs, which are advertisements painted onto the sides of buildings. In our research, we have discovered that Coca-Cola has used and continues to use each and every one of these different mediums to advertise their product. With so many reminders of Coca-Cola's presence, how could we not be reminded that we are, in fact, a little thirsty? <laughs> Coca-Cola has done such a good job of inserting itself into American culture that it has become a part of American culture. Think for just a moment about what images come to mind when you think of America. 
One might be little boys and girls on bicycles riding down a small town main street, passing a red painted sign saying Coca-Cola. This gives further pause to the question of whether advertising caters to the culture or whether advertising actually creates the culture. You look out upon a cityscape and see amongst the buildings a cross, standing clearly black against the fiery oranges and reds of a sunset. You see a 50-foot American flag blowing in the wind. You're driving along and glimpse a red octagon. Immediately, your foot is headed toward the break. A cross, a flag, a stop sign. All of these things are just that, things. But they are also symbols, and in today's society, they carry deeper meanings and can cause emotional or even physiological reactions in people. Advertising has trivialized symbols and ideas. They seriously overuse and casually toss around symbols and ideas which originally stood for something great. As my colleague, Ms. Cautry, discussed, symbols and images have just been used to sell products because they tie emotions felt when you see those images to the product. If you use the right words with the right image, there can be an instantaneous and often even subconscious effect on people. It is the tying together of an idea or a symbol with a product combined with the overuse of advertisements, as Ms. Reinhaus mentioned, that has led to the trivialization of these symbols. Some instances of ideas and symbols that have been trivialized by marketers are happiness. For example, you just saw a product the advertisement saying Coke is happiness, as though a beverage could provide something as deep as happiness. Religion is trivialized. Politics as well including liberty symbols. For example, the clothing company American Eagle has eagles on all of their clothing and a name which is a term that may once have inspired feelings of nationalism and pride, but now brings to mind comfy sweaters and new jeans. <laughs> also trivialized is joie de vivre, or the joy of living. This can be seen in a, with American Eagle as well, as they put sayings such as live your life on their t-shirts. Additionally, the Miracle Whip commercial you saw earlier uses joie de vivre. Family and human relationships are also trivialized by marketers. The ideas and symbols being used in an ad may stand or have stood for something great, but even though the values seen in an ad might be, may be good, the intentions behind the ad are not driven by those values. It is important to remember that a corporation's primary concern is to make a profit for themselves and their shareholders. Miracle Whip cares about your social life as long as it makes them money. Coke cares about happiness if it makes people purchase their product. As Neil Postman says in his book, Technopoly, one picture, we are told, is worth a thousand words, but a thousand pictures, especially if they are of the same object, may not be worth anything at all. <laughs> so we come to the question, uh, does advertising influence society, or is, it, or is society influenced by advertising? The answer is both. Pallet describes advertising as a distorted mirror that reflects where we are and where we want to be. The perfume ads of the 1970s show just this. Charles of the Ritz creates a jolie the new eight hour perfume for the 24 hour woman. I can bring home a bacon. Mm -hmm. the career and the family, and this was becoming a social reality even though it wasn't as widely accepted. Advertisements flood the media with this message, and once society and advertising find the idea commonplace, they move on to the next trend. The trend now is to be green, and it has taken over parts of the market, and its presence is beginning to be seen.